So today we wanted to talk a little bit about the changing demographics in the workforce and how that affects one of the two primary assets that we invest in, apartments. Yeah. What's interesting is that these, uh, first off, the demographics are changing. And what we're talking about today is the, the front line of that trend. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, the, the workforce is now over 50% female. Uh, somewhere between 47 and 55 percent. That's about a five to seven percent change from 10 years ago mm -hmm. and probably double that from 20 years ago. That's likely to keep changing. Uh, families are being more uh, more blended in that uh, with more women working, uh, they're either getting married later or they're getting married less. Mm -hmm. There's commonly two incomes in, in the home. Uh, there's multi-generational housing and it's more diverse. So there's yeah. a lot of uh, things happening. At, by 2030, 75 million Americans will be over 65 years old, which is about 20% of the population. And also about 25% of the US population will have been born outside of the United States. So uh, America is getting more diverse. There's a greater need to, to lease units in other languages, um, especially in some of the markets we serve. Uh, and also Americans are getting older and they're needing more childcare options and more people are working. So the question so, is, what does this mean for us and what types of apartments are we buying and why and how are we meeting uh, the changing need of the customer? Well, and I, we start by looking at the markets that we're in. Yeah. We are in secondary and tertiary markets. We are not in primary markets. So our focus, our interest, and our need to meet that tenant demand is very different than working in a primary market. In the markets where we're, we are in, people are focused on affordability. They're focused on value. They're focused, they've come to these markets because they're looking to increase their quality of life. Right. Whether they are owning a home or whether they are renting, they're looking to increase their space and get more value for, for their dollars. So as we sit here today in the Central Valley, right, right in the middle of it, by the way, there's 7 million people in the Central Valley, mm -hmm. uh, it feels like, and the data backs it up that the Central Valley, that the Bay Area has shifted towards the Central Valley. And LA has There's, shifted toward the Central Valley. LA has shifted north and the Bay Area has shifted west. So with this shift, we are seeing more demand for our two, three, and four bedroom units. And what's interesting is there's a couple of schools of thought in investing. It feels like the more institutional thought is to build smaller, newer apartments and charge the highest rent possible per square foot. Yep. Our strategy has been to buy more two, three, and even four bedroom units. We have some of those, mm -hmm. um, but our price per square foot is much lower and the value we're delivering to the customer is, is different. So they, when they have a choice of paying 16, 17, $1,800 for a newer, smaller one bedroom apartment, or that same amount for a 10 or 15 year older, maybe 20 year yeah. older, but uh, nicely fixed up, larger unit, maybe double yeah. the size, it's with balconies, with uh, yard space in a good neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, that's the trade-off. Well, and you're hitting on two different demographic trends. Uh, one is the, the fact that people are living, more people in a housing environment today than they were before. Some of that is people rooming, roommating up, you know, because r they, they need to, to be able to achieve the type of living environment that they want. The other thing is the multi-generational housing where you've got, if you've got more people in the workforce, you have more reliance on childcare. You often have, you know, grandparents living in a similar environment and it allows for that kind of environment. So it seems like our strategy of buying larger units at a lower price per square foot uh, has legs for the long term. It, it feels like people are gonna, going to want larger spaces and have more people living there and want a greater quality of life. Yeah, and that reminds me of a graph that I saw recently that talked about the type of housing that is being built new. Mm -hmm. And in the 60s, 70s, 80s, there was much more kind of middle income and workforce housing being built new. Mm -hmm. And over the last 20 years, it's been almost exclusive that new development is premium, high rent, uh, upper income uh, product. And so with that, you've got essentially a lack of supply of the type of product that a large segment of the population wants or needs. Well, also during this work from home shift, there have been people that have moved to the mid-sized cities and 
more mountain towns and more coastal cities. Yeah. Um, for us, we focus on those mid-sized cities, those secondary and tertiary markets. But that's brought in a new group of people that are looking for a quality of life. So we are we are serving two demographics here: a quality of life migrant and also someone who's got multiple generations and yeah. a, a need for more space. Yeah, and that that hits on kind of another key demographic shift that is influencing apartments, which is this more hybrid, flexible, work from home, remote work environment. What that does is it makes people become untethered from their their place of work. And as we've seen over the last several years, this is a sticky trend. Certainly there's been some, you know, kind of like bounce back a little bit to kind of what our normal was before, but clearly there is a new era of flexibility, remote work. Collier's recently put out a report that ranked top cities for remote work environment. And interestingly, many times when they rank top cities, what are they looking at? They're looking at quality of life, they're looking at amenities, but then the interesting kind of addition to that is affordability. Mm -hmm. Because when people are looking for a remote work environment, a lot of times it's because they're seeking a quality of life that includes a level of an affordability that allows them to live that full quality of life. You know, in, in cities like New York and San Francisco, oftentimes 40 or 50% or more of your income is just going to housing costs. Yeah. In markets where we operate, that's 20, 25, 30% on the high end of the income that goes toward housing costs. So you've got a, a, a shift of people into markets like that. And on the Collier's report, it was interesting out of the top 25 major metro areas that uh, where they said uh, remote work is conducive in those environments. Three of them are in markets that we operate in, Sacramento, Salt Lake City, and the Denver metro area. I was looking at the census data and it said that in 2011, 13% of the workforce worked from home part of the time. Today, according to that data, it's 34%. So that's an absolutely dramatic shift in about 10 years. Uh -huh. You look at some of these tech companies, I mean, Facebook changed its name to Meta and is pretty <laughs> focused on these uh, headsets. But if you look at AI and you look at technology and you look at how it's gotten, I mean, even the people listening to this podcast are forming opinions about the world based on us not meeting in person. And yeah. it's, it seems likely that over the next 10 years, that shift will continue to be dramatic. I, I think that workers will, like the trust piece and the collaboration piece uh, is really important to do in person, but will be diminished. You will be able to do more of that mm -hmm. remotely. And I, that should uh, increase the value of non-primary markets. Yeah, and then you, going back to how that affects apartment demand, if people are working from home, they're doing remote work, the, the, we all saw during COVID, all of a sudden our living environment became just a glaring spotlight. Where's my quiet space to do this Zoom call? When can I not have the dog barking? How can I have a concentration space? And so effectively it's moved the some of the real estate demand from office to housing. Yeah. And that's where we continue to see that kind of those, we, the, a lot of times the units that we buy because they were built in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, they're a little bigger square footage. They have a little more room to them. Uh, we're able to buy them at a lower cost per square foot. Tenants are able to rent them at a lower cost per square foot, which means they get more room to be able to create their a homework environment, their concentration space, that sort of thing. It's interesting. If you think about it, there's about the same number of humans. And those humans used to occupy floors in larger buildings to do their job. So they took up two spaces. They had a home space and they had a workspace. And there was a physical amount of square footage that they took up in those two environments. Uh, now that square footage, some of it, actual square mm -hmm. footage has transferred into apartments and houses because there are desks and there's a need for a buffer zone where mm -hmm. the dog can't bark and there's there's a greater need like an actual physical square footage uh, need or a utility yep. uh, in in those apartments so some office space now is in housing yeah absolutely <laughs> there there isn't a direct 
double usage. There is, yeah. it's probably one and a half times or something like that. In, and kind of speaking to the stickiness of that trend, uh, there's a, a graph that uh, is really telling that shows the number of new business licenses that have been uh, applied for in, in that given period of time. And the historical average, I forget what the actual numbers are, but the historical average is kind of at one level. And then obviously with COVID, that shot up to a doubling of what the historical average was. But what's interesting is it's only tapered off a little bit. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like we're in a new, and, and the type of business licenses are in businesses that are not likely to have lots of employees. Yeah. So they're this independent contractor kind of gig economy environment. With the work from home trend going from 13% in 2011 to 34% today, that's likely to continue. It, it seems like, in my opinion, there's two parts to working from home. There's the trust and collaboration. Like you can't get work done without trust and without ideas. And that part seems to be changing. I mean, Zoom is one level, but then these headsets and like uh, greater dynamic uh, views of people, uh, more of a meeting space from people maybe even all over the world um, is happening more. But also the ability to have the data, the machine learning data, the better aggregated, better categorized, uh, like we see this in real estate, the ability to analyze assets with cell phone data and uh, individual market data and specific neighborhood data and asset data is greater than it's ever been that I've seen in the last 20 years. So when you have the data to make decisions and you have the trust and collaboration to make de decisions, you can uh, drive impact e even remotely. So it seems like we're at 34% now, that could easily be 50%, uh, you know, 10 years from now, it could easily be 60%, especially yeah. as you add in AI, where so much of uh, work is being done in the background prior to decisions even being made. It's like work is served up in a way that that person can take their experience and trust and, and change the world with it. Yeah, and we are definitely seeing today how those influences, those demographic changes, both the change in the composition of the workforce and then also the change in how we do work is affecting our apartment investing and, and we think it will continue as we, as we move forward. Thank you for listening to Durable Value, an investor's podcast, where we demystify commercial real estate with safe, sound investment strategies to help you balance your portfolio. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to rate it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more, visit crusadapartners.com, where you'll find more information, investors' tools, case studies, and more. This podcast is hosted by Joe Miratori and Ryan Suela. It's produced, edited, and mixed by Melodic, with intro music by Ian Post. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.